Everybody, we are actually right on schedule. Woo! So <laughs> proud of us. Woo. Uh, I'm gonna go grab Andrew. Hopefully, he's ready to we go. We just have two to go, right? Praise the Lord. Two Jesus to go. Christ. Plus, if we want to do Lord Most High, we could mm -hmm. probably oh. will be we'll be able to give it a quick run. We're gonna add our trumpet player, so you guys might need to adjust or tell him where to stand or move that. We're just gonna have him be picked up by that congregation. Phil, Mike, is that? Yes, yeah. Oh, Meredith, hi, good morning. Oh, thanks for grabbing him. Andrew! What's up, Woo! Good morning, Andrew. Good morning. How are you feeling? <laughs> feeling ready to play five sharps? <laughs> Hope you find your dad. I am walking in the dirt. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, vocalists, have you found it easier to follow this versus sheet music. I just have the keyboard. Okay, great. What have What have you found more helpful? It's to only you and Sarah, or you and Becky, who have that. Oh, okay, great. great. So yeah. never mind. Then. Follow what you want. <clears throat> great. So we'll do our. We'll start with Christ. Mm, nope, the other one. Jesus Christ is risen today. We'll start there. Oh, this is such a high song. It is so <laughs> high. Yeah. <laughs> Imagine this song at 6.30 in the morning. <laughs> you sang no. it this morning? Let, yeah. Let's not do that. <laughs> so Josh is going to be the lead singer on yes. the last verse. Yes. yes. Uh, and Jeff and Andrew, you guys are taking us off. Jesus Christ is risen today, Alleluia. Our triumphant holy day, Alleluia. Who did once upon the cross, Alleluia, suffer to
Great job, Andrew. Woo. Yeah. Applause. Awesome. Also, it doesn't matter if I can't sing the high notes because the trumpet is. Right. Yes, you don't, don't need. Perfect. Love the trumpet. Uh, I forgot you're going to do the march. I love the march, so we'll follow you. And I am not going to. I'm not going to like.
The grace of our risen Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Thank you. I've been waiting a long time to be able to say that. It's good to welcome you here. It's, uh, this is spring break week for a lot of folks, which means a bunch of our community are traveling out of the area, but that also means that there are people that have traveled in. And so if that's you, if you're visiting some friends or family, or you're new to this space, we're just really pleased to have you here to welcome you uh, to celebrate this occasion with you. My name is Eric. Um, with Heather to my immediate right. We are the pastors of this church and we're just delighted to be able to enter into this time of celebration. Um, if nothing else, you should know this, that, it's, uh, that Easter represents the definitive experience that God in Christ has overcome all the powers of sin and evil and even death, has just vanquished all of those dark powers and ushered us into a newness of life, the new creation. I know for some of us, uh, this might be the first Easter uh, in the wake of the death of someone that you care about deeply. And so for you, this is an, uh, uh, an especially poignant uh, day to uh, be reminded that your beloved are resurrected with Christ. There are certain words that defy translation, and the Bible retains a few of those original words. We're actually going to be singing one of them today. It sometimes sounds like alleluia and sometimes hallelujah. Uh, it's a translation issue. You don't need to worry about it, uh, <laughs> but we're going uh, to voice it. And, um, but you might want to know that it's essentially a word that is sort of this ascription of praise. It's like, praise the Lord. Uh, and we've been in a Alleluia Lenten fast for the last 40 days. I'm getting a little ring here, Bob. Uh, in fact, our children created an Alleluia banner, buried it uh, on Ash Wednesday, and they're going to dig it up a little bit later today. But this is the first time that in this sanctuary the word gets uttered in celebration that Christ is risen. Let us worship God. Let's stand. Jesus Christ is risen today. Alleluia. Our triumphant holy day. Father, Son, and 
Christ is risen. Risen indeed. If then you have been raised with Christ, Alleluia, Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Alleluia. Alleluia. Oh uh-huh. 
Today, this most joyous day when the bright blue sky and the warmth of the sun remind us of spring and the promise of new life, we praise you, Lord. Hallelujah. We praise you for your strength and power and your love that conquers sin and darkness. Because of Jesus' life, his death, and his resurrection, we can say with boldness, where, O death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? Death has been swallowed up in Christ's victory. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Amen. The Lamb has overcome The Lamb precision in how we see and understand God. 
that through the resurrection, we have lenses to see more clearly who God is and who we are and who we're not. So as we join together in a prayer of confession, I'd encourage you to consider the ways that we sometimes want to place ourselves on that throne, the throne on which the lamb is sitting, the lamb who has conquered. In, uh, in Christian world, we sometimes call that idolatry, making an idol, making something like a god that shouldn't be God. And we tend to do that with ourselves. We want to be the one sitting on the throne. So as we join together in this time of confession, consider the ways that, that you perhaps want to have power like God or control like God or be the center of your own will. Let's pray. On this resurrection day, O oh Lord, we see you clearly for who you are, a God who lives for us, a God who died for us, and a God who raises us to your life. We see you this day as sovereign, and we confess that sometimes we want to be sovereign in our own lives, self-sufficient, autonomous, independent. Have mercy. God, we see you through Jesus as being exalted above all creation. And sometimes we admit that we want to be seen in a prideful way, exalted, with glory, with honor. Have mercy on us for the ways that we put ourselves into your place. God, this day we see your power, your power to reorient the whole world under your reign. We confess ways that we grasp at power, power to control, power to manipulate, power to make ourselves seem better than others. God, have mercy on us. And especially, Lord, this day we see Jesus crowned as Lord of all. Hallelujah. And we confess that we often want to be the lords of our own lives. So we bring ourselves before your throne and confess Jesus is Lord, not myself, not someone else, not king, not country. Jesus is Lord of my life and all creation, the one before, before whom every knee bows. We bring all these prayers before your throne, O oh God, risen, alive. And we ask for your mercy. Amen. Amen. Friends, Jesus' victory over sin and death reorients everything. It turns the whole world upside down and it releases us from the clutches of that desire to be Lord, to be in control, to be independent, autonomous, self-sufficient, because the tomb is empty this day, and because all that was dead is alive again, we are assured in our baptisms that we too have the life of God in us through Christ. So through Jesus we are raised, through Jesus, we are forgiven, and through Jesus, we live. Be at peace today. Thanks be to God.
what we cry out today and every day because every day is a celebration of the resurrection. And it's because of that that we have been infused with a goodness and a beauty, even a holiness that we see all around us. Look outside. Look at the faces around you. In this, we see the holiness, the goodness, and the beauty of God. And we have the opportunity to say thanks to God for that in the way that we give our lives to him. And that takes a lot of shapes. It takes shape in the way that we give our finances. And more than that, it takes shape in the way that we give our lives to one another in the way that Christ gave his life to us. So the ushers are going to come forward in a moment to receive our tithes and our offerings and also You have an invitation, if you want to, uh, to write out a prayer or color a reflection of the beauty of God that you see today on the piece of paper that's maybe in the seat pocket in front of you, maybe, or use your bulletin, or up at these tables up here, um, there's some paper, too, to draw and color. And also, you can come up and light a candle. All of these are ways that we, in our bodies, feel and express the goodness of the living God. Uh, So really would encourage you, especially if you are a young one or you're young at heart, to um, use these embodied stations for offering ourselves and our whole lives to God.
has won, Christ has conquered, and we shall reign with Him, for He lives, Christ is risen from the dead, and we shall reign with Him, for He lives, Christ is risen from the Let's pray. God, for your goodness, for your life, we give you thanks. And we pray that these offerings, this art, these prayers, this dancing would all be swept up in your love and used to show your life to all those around us. In the name of the risen Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. Please stand with us as you're able. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son. At this time, children may be dismissed for children's wor worship and will return after the sermon. Isaiah 53, 4 through 12. Surely he has borne our infirmities and carried our diseases. Yet we accounted him stricken, struck down by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our inequities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole, and by his bruises we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have all turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid upon on him the inequity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth, like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that is before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By a perversion of justice he was taken away. Who could have, met, who could have imagined his future? For he was cut off from the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. They made his grave with the wicked and his tomb with the rich, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him in with pain. When you make his life an offering for sin, he shall see his offspring and shall prolong his days. Through him, the will of the Lord shall prosper. Out of his anguish, he shall see light. He shall find satisfaction through his knowledge. The righteous one, my servant, shall make many righteous, and he shall bear their inequities. Therefore, I will allot him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured him out himself to death, and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgression. Thanks, AJ. One of the reasons it's important to listen to Isaiah on a day like this is as a firm reminder that um, what happened on Easter was not um, an afterthought. It wasn't like a hiccup to the messianic mission. This was the plan all along. So Isaiah is foretelling the suffering servant. It's just this helpful reminder that God has this overarching um, salvation story that's playing out, uh, I almost said played out, it's playing out presently, even among us. And now I want us to turn our attention over to the gospel, John chapter 20. We're going to listen to it in its entirety. It's admittedly a large, expansive passage, but I have been sort of convicted this year that we uh, need to hear the whole story uh, rather than, you know, chopping it up in little pieces. So, just so you know, I'm not going to preach on the whole passage. Um, I mean, I, I am, but I'm not going to cover every verse. Uh, but I want you to hear the context of what I think God has to say to us this year. John 20, hear the word of God. 
early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, pretty sure this is John, and said to them, they've taken the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they've laid him. Then Peter and the other disciple set out and went toward the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings lying there and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to their homes. But Mary, Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They've taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they've laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. And Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you've laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabunai, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not hold on to me, because I've not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he'd said these things to her. When it was evening on that same day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. And although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you've seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. That, by the way, is you and me. Now, Jesus did many other things in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing, you may have life in his name. This is the word of the Lord. Be to 
Let us pray. Prepare our hearts, O Lord, to now accept your word. Silence in us any voice but your own, that hearing we may also obey your will. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, a lot of important things happened there. If you're not afraid of it, the dark. It's where new life begins. I think, for example, of the dark womb where gestation takes place, resulting after nine months in the birth of a baby, or the dark warming soil of the earth where germination takes place, resulting eventually in the emergence of a plant. Darkness. It's where nocturnal dreams reveal hidden parts of our unconscious minds. Whatever form it takes, the cover of darkness is often precisely the fertile environment for the eruption of life. And so it should come to us as little surprise that a biblical worldview actually favors darkness, at least as a beginning or a starting point. Think about this. At the dawn of creation, God spoke a word into the darkness, and from it the world began to take shape. Let there be light. It's equally unsurprising that the inauguration of the new age, also known as the kingdom of God, began in the darkness of night. Recall with me that it's the environment into which an angel of the Lord visited a band of shepherds who were watching their flocks by night with the exceedingly good and joyful news that the Messiah had at long last come, arriving as a baby Born in Bethlehem, the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not, cannot overcome it. All of which is why I have to think the dawn of the new creation was also shrouded in darkness. The gospel says that from about noon to three o'clock, as the life light was going out of Jesus, as he experienced the dread of God forsakenness, the world went dark. The total eclipse of the sun. But before the world altering event, there was another dark moment in our story that I think may shed some light on the significance of this day that we've come here together to celebrate. It was the evening of Passover. Remember this, that commemorative meal that recalls the night God delivered the people, uh, the people of God out of Egyptian slavery, out of their dark night of oppression. And at that meal, Jesus deviated from the time-worn liturgical script of the Passover when he took the bread off the table, ripped it in two, and then spoke words that I'm pretty sure had never been spoken before in the history of the world up to that point. This is my body, broken for you. Distinct echoes of those words came to mind recently as I was stretched out on my yoga mat, right about where Lori Perry is sitting. The chairs were removed. It was a darkened room here one evening as my wife Elizabeth was leading us in her weekly Monday evening yoga class, which always includes a really thoughtful breath prayer. And on that night, a couple of weeks ago now, it sounded like this. This is my body living for you. 
The words struck a deep chord within me, awakening my sacramental sensibilities, giving voice to the enduring desire that has driven me, motivated me from the time that I was a youth. I want my life to count. This is my lifelong prayer. I want to be a part of what God is doing. Take me. Use me. But I've never had quite this way to say it, this unique language. This is my body living for you. No other words have managed to capture this enduring desire of my heart. And so, I don't know, it would seem that there are a lot of good things that emerge from the darkness, even troubling darkness. Now, the thing about darkness, just to state the obvious, is that it's hard to see. And I, yeah, I, you know, I'm here to tell the truth. <laughs> um, yeah, but I've become persuaded that this is actually um, intentional. This is by God's design. For reasons that I don't fully understand, God's approach to us is usually kind of oblique. It sort of takes a side angle approach. It's indirect and subtle. For a book that we believe to be God's revelation, it often reads like a mystery. I mean, vast portions of it are viewed through gauzy images. The exceptionally smart ones and the highly educated ones among us meet the challenge just like the rest of us. As we explore the strange new world of the Bible, we are always often found just groping in the dark. Which means, does it not, that we can never be totally confident about God. We mustn't ever be too sure of ourselves when it comes to spiritual vision, none of us sees 2020. And so there's always a chance that we could be wrong because as Paul says, we see through a glass darkly. Gosh, I can't seem to get past verse one. While it was still dark. While it was still dark, Mary. Ah, oh, Mary. Mary of Magdala, also better known to us as Mary Magdalene. Uh, we don't know a lot about her except that Jesus uh, delivered her of seven demons. Subsequently, she spent much of the remaining days of Jesus' life with him. She traveled with him, listened to him as he taught, bore witness as he performed miracles. She supported him financially. But this is the thing I believe she should be remembered for. At the end of his life, all four Gospels agree on this. It's a consistent witness. While most of the disciples either betrayed him, fell asleep on him, ran away from him, or denied him, Mary Magdalene was there, present and accounted for. She remained with Jesus through his whole life. Ordeal. She was present in the darkness of the cross. She was present in the darkness of the tomb. And because of that presence, because she was the first eyewitness to the empty tomb, she ran swiftly and announced to the bereaved and bleary-eyed disciples that Jesus had been raised, making her, in the elegant words of St. Thomas, of, uh, St. Thomas Aquinas, the apostle to the apostles. With all four Gospels agreeing on those details, I can only wonder if a church that doesn't allow women to preach accurately reflects the church that Jesus imagined carrying on his work. She was the apostle to the apostles. But that doesn't mean she got everything right. None of us do. It was still dark, after all. And so none of us, I don't think, are in a position to criticize her when she mistook the freshly resurrected Jesus for the gardener. 
But this was the unique opportunity afforded her, the reward for remaining in this dark, uncomfortable environment that reeked of death while the brothers, assuming all that was really left was a pile of dirty laundry in an empty tomb, went home. Hmm. Like so many life-altering moments, it began with a voice. Woman, why are you weeping? It's exactly the same question the angels asked her two verses previous. And it just strikes me as odd. odd. Almost a silly question. Why am I weeping? Well, because that's what emotionally intelligent people do when they're beside themselves with sadness, when our lives have been turned upside down and we have no way of finding our equilibrium again. Because sometimes the loss is so great, the only appropriate response is to cry. But she didn't bother with any of that. Didn't waste time answering the question. Instead, she had a question of her own. Sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you've laid him, and I will take him away. Now, interestingly, this is not the first time she's heard his voice. But this time, he called her by name, making me wonder mm, if there was a particularly affectionate way he used to address her, or a unique tone of voice that made her finally identify him. Mary. And after that stunning moment of voice recognition, he sent her. He apostled her. Back to the disciples with a message. <laughs> but did you notice this? Uh, she prefaced it with her own. Verse 18. I have seen the Lord. Apostle to the apostles. That's the apostolic witness. Well, that's Mary. Most of us, I think, are inclined to go easy on Thomas as well. Uh, for refusing to believe what he hadn't yet seen for himself, even though the ten remaining disciples insisted in precisely the same language used by Mary, we have seen the Lord. After Jesus appeared to them and breathed on them and showed them the wounds in his hands and side. Uh, but Thomas wasn't so easily convinced because he wasn't just squinting in the dark like Mary. He wasn't there to see anything at all. And so he comes in response with this firm resolve. Unless I also touch his body and see his wounds, I refuse. I will not believe. I feel like I just want to ask a question right here. What might it be that's holding you back from believing right now? No doubt we all have our doubts. I certainly do. We're surrounded by skeptics. And so who's going to blame us for the times we channel our inner Thomases? I mean, let's be honest. We're talking about something that defies rationality, it's a claim that breaks the rules of nature, it simply cannot be explained by science. And so for thinking people, doubt is normal. Thomas is exhibit A. I'm so grateful that John was honest enough to tell us that part of the story. But the reason Gosh, I'm able to stand before you today and join Mary Magdalene and the other apostles in saying, I have seen the Lord. Is because I've been met by the risen Christ. This Lent, in the wounds of Jacob and in the wounds of David and Mephibosheth, in the wounds of Saul and the wounds of Naaman, and the wounds of both Jairus' daughter and the bleeding woman. And I have been met by the risen Christ more personally 
still, for I have found that Jesus doesn't stand at a distance from my wounded self, but moves toward me, revealing his own scars in solidarity with me, essentially saying to me, "Mm, yeah, this world can be harsh, Eric. It hurt me too. But I'm still here. And I'm here with you to make sure you are also going to be well. After all, I've overcome this world. That's how Jesus is revealed to us. In brokenness. The breaking of the bread and the wounds of the body, both his and ours. On this Resurrection Sunday, on the year of our Lord, 2024, the one known to us as the light of the world, I believe, oh, well, I know, is often hidden from view in the shadows of the world. And you know why? Because Jesus, both then and now, gravitates to the dark places, the hard places, the lonely places, the grim and even hellish places in solidarity with the people who occupy those places, the poor, the oppressed, the victims, the hungry, the homeless, the rejected, anyone who is crucified at his left or his right. And Jesus doesn't walk away from them himself unscathed. He retains his own wounds. This is by God's design. He's the wounded healer. Wherever you presently are in your understanding and embrace or acceptance of this story, and wherever you are right now in your relationship with Jesus, I want you to hear his voice. The one who once said, this is my body broken for you. Now saying, this is my body risen for you. And I invite your response, if you're so inclined, perhaps touch a part of your own body or strike a posture of self-offering and respond with that breath prayer. This is my body living for you. You want to try that? This is my body risen for you and you respond this is my body living for you john ends here by telling us the purpose for which he wrote his gospel that we may ourselves move beyond the doubts move beyond our hurts and come to believe that jesus is the son of god and through believing we may have life in his name And so I now just want to invite you to join me in reciting the Apostles' Creed as an opportunity to say what we believe, belief that leads to life. It's in your bulletin. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus. I don't have it in front of me. (laughs) I I lost my place. Uh, Continue. I believe... In Jesus Christ.
Christ still rises when fear grips our city, when death takes no pity, when much is unknown. Christ still rises when friends are divided, when joy feels misguided, when we are alone. Still rises when churches are shattered, when praises are muttered, when prayers go unsaid. Christ still rises when peace has all faded, when we are most jaded, when faith turns to dread. When faith turns to dread, Christ still rises when we give to neighbors, when we share our labors, when strangers belong. Christ still rises when we come together, when love is our tether, when hope is our song. Christ still rises when grieving is ended, when bodies are mended, when beauty is pain. Christ still rises when fear has retreated, when death is defeated, and joy will remain, and joy will remain. Um, I want to lead us in prayer, but before we do, just a couple of quick things. Uh, today looks a little different for us here, so there's no education hour. We do have refreshments um, over in the gathering place, and there's time. If you're a child to um, run back there, as you are prone to do, run like the women, and um, you can decide who's Peter, who's John, the faster of the two. Get a donut, something to drink. Um, yeah, <clears throat> I'm just sort of, I'm just acknowledging what is. Um, and then the rest of us can hobble that way for, um, for a donut or a cup of coffee and some conversation. We won't have an education hour that follows, but um, children, and you can uh, define your own, uh, whether, whether you're a child or not, are going to gather outside here and dig up. We'll start by digging up the Alleluia banner that's been buried for the last 40 days. And... Um, and there's probably some liturgy that goes with that. Um, and then follow the instructions of your teachers, and then there's an Easter egg hunt that will follow. I think that's it. If I don't get to say anything to you on the way out, um, I hope it's just a good remainder of the day, and I hope that you carry with you uh, the spirit and the hope and the joy of the resurrection. Let's pray. God, in the midst of all the chaos, the uncertainty, the fear, and the reek of death. We locate ourselves, we reorient ourselves in this glad reality that you have indeed overcome all the forces of darkness and evil because you have descended from heaven, itinerated planet Earth, descended into the belly of hell, and burst out of the tomb, thereby opening the way for all of us to be welcomed into paradise forever. We're so grateful that you do this as a great act of love. God so loved the world 
that he sent the Son. We're grateful for the obedience of the Son. And we long to be such people who enter this world as little lights, as little incarnations of the resurrection, embodying this good reality, bearing witness, saying in so many words, I too have seen the Lord. Meantime, we pray for a world that is punctuated by darkness, where violence seems to be the rule of the day, where war and strife exist. We dare once again to pray for the peace of Jerusalem and its outlying areas, particularly in the Gaza Strip. May your shalom be infused with new life, We believe in the resurrection, and so we believe that you can overcome even that which appears to us to be deadly, dark, and impossible. Hear our prayers. God, for what is ahead of us that some of us are dreading, perhaps a sense of foreboding or anxiety, we give that to you as well believing that you go ahead of us. You are the God of the past, present, and future, collapsing as one in the eternal now. So we trust you with our very lives going forward into this week, into the remainder of this year. We trust you to lead us. Grant us the faith to believe where our eyes have not yet seen, that we may claim you as our Lord as well. Grateful now to be counted among the disciples. Grateful to be appointed as among the apostles. Giving voice and volition to this good news. We commit ourselves to you. This is our body living for you. We pray all this in the name of Christ, who taught his friends to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Our closing song today is one that's familiar to many of us. It was written by our former music director, and the hymn tune is named Colbert, after this congregation. We're adding a little bit to the beginning and also to the end of this song in a pattern of call and response. The reason why we're doing that today um, is because that is the pattern of our faith. God moves towards us with a gracious initiative And we respond to that. And in this hymn in particular, in which we're declaring what we believe, we can only claim that and proclaim it because God in Christ has intimately moved toward us to show us not only what we believe, but in whom we believe and how to believe. So the call and response at the beginning of this song is intended to remind us that sometimes not all of us can voice these words. But Jesus is leading the way, and the community of faith sings and speaks for us, even when we can't. Uh, So I invite you to stand as you're able. Um, The beginning again, follow um, Josh and Sarah and me in the response. Becky will lead the, the, the initiative line, and then we'll all join together in singing the hymn. I believe in God Almighty.
Just as we practiced earlier, I wish you could each hear your name prefacing it, but there are too many of you. Uh, but if your name is Mary, um, you're, the, you're the lucky ones. Uh, remember the response to this reality is, this is my body living for you. Mary, this is my body risen for you. And you say, this is my body living for you. Go in that life. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you deep, deep peace. In the name of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.